Hi everybody and thanks for joining us for today's webinar on FTIR in physics applications. I'm joined today by Xia Stammer, who is an expert when it comes to applying FTIR spectroscopy in physics applications. She is also a long-standing member of our research and development application team and will be the main speaker today. My name is Simon and I am part of the routine FTIR application team and will be the host of this session. Xia will begin by refreshing some fundamentals of FTIR spectroscopy. And after that, we talk about the basic principles of time resolved techniques in FTIR, as these are frequently needed in physics applications. She will also touch the topic of emission spectroscopy, which is widely applied for material science, semiconductor R&D, and optoelectronic device development in physics. Here's a quick outline of our agenda in today's webinar. We start with applications in laser physics and then go from biophysics to optoelectronics and semiconductor physics. We'll show you that FTIR is a powerful tool to characterize and reveal optical properties of almost any material or device. But let me reassure you, even if your area of expertise is not featured here and you don't see yourself working in the fields above, this webinar is for you. I'll promise that if you're working in physics, our webinar will cover topics and techniques that are of interest to you or at least might inspire some new ideas. So what is the general intent of this webinar? Well, we mainly want to do three things. First, we give a broad overview across the FTIR applications in physics and occasionally we will also dive a little bit into the application to explain it better. By doing so, we hope to draw a clear picture of IR spectroscopy where it is really good at and how you can apply it in your own research. Secondly, we want to showcase the unique abilities of IR spectroscopy. In many labs, IR is just a quick and dirty method of basic characterization, a technique that's mainly used by chemists. Truth be told, many physicists don't see the true value of this established and well-proven technology. And while we're being honest, there is a good reason for that. The technique is more than 50 years old and definitely not a hot topic anymore. But you might be surprised what FTIR can achieve and what information width and depth is actually possible. Lastly, we also want to educate our audience. Maybe you are not fully familiar with IR. Maybe you dealt with infrared spectroscopy years ago and need a little refresher. Maybe you don't know the capacity and all the tricks in the box of FTIR. So, of course, we'll briefly explain the basics of FTIR, but above all, we want to educate about the potential of IR spectroscopy in physics. How does time-resolved spectroscopy work? And when is it needed? And how is it applied in physics? Compared to other analytical methods used in physics, such as electron spectroscopy, electron microscopy, or near-field methods, FTIR is incredibly easy to use and a low-cost choice in providing more information than you expect. And at the end of the webinar, I hope we have made this clear. And with that, I kindly give the word to Xia Stammer. Thank you very much, Simon, for the introduction. First of all, to understand the principle, the benefits and the handling of FTIR, and especially time-resolved methods, TRS in short, I would like to explain or repeat the basic principle and the main components of the FTIR technique. The heart of a, of, a, of a FTIR spectrometer is the interferometer. The interferometer consists of the following parts. We have the light source. From there, the light goes to the beam splitter, which split the light into two parts half transmitted and half reflected. One goes to a fixed mirror and the other to a mov movable mirror. When the movable mirror moves, it generates a position-dependent optical path difference between the two light beams. And these two beams will recombine again at the beam splitter and interfere with each other and go to the detector at the end. The detector measures the light intensity as a function of the position of the moving mirror, and this gives us a so-called interferogram. And a mathematical operation of FT, Fourier transform, um, via a computer converts that interferogram into a spectrum of the light source. This working principle is fundamental for every FTIR spectrometer. 
the achievable spectral range of the FDIR spectrometer depends on the optical components such as a source, beam splitter, mirrors, and the detectors. The FDIR spectrometer is a very powerful tool in the in infrared spectral range. By applying different optical components, it is also applicable for the visible and UV ranges. The performance of the FTIR spectrometer will mainly depend on the interferometer, the entire optical design, the optical components, and the quality of the electronics. The spectral resolution of the FTIR spectrometer depends on how far the moving mirror can go. The further the moving mirror can move, the higher the resolution can be. To collect the interferogram, we must also define the sampling points. Normally, we use a single wavelength laser, as it will generate a nice cosine function in the interferogram, and then we can use the zero crossing points as the sampling points. The interferogram shape is very crucial and highly depends on the source spectrum. Well, to understand how the interferogram of a source looks like, we should first imagine a hypothetical source with nine equal discrete emission lines. Each line delivers a cosine function, a cosine curve, as interferogram but the detector just sees the sum of all individual contributions. And this results in a peak in the middle of the overall interferogram where all components have a maximum, and into winds of the interferogram where the intensity decreases more and more. Now we can imagine the following rule, rule of thumb. The broader the light spectrum is, the more we have a well-defined center burst together with decreasing intensity in the wings. For example, here we have a black body as source emitting light in a broad mid-infrared range, and its interferogram will look like this, which has a very sharp maximum in the center, the so-called center burst. Now, coming to the TRS method. One challenging sin scenario in physics is to follow very fast processes. For example, to follow optical profiles uh, with fast changes and fluctuations along time axis. A normal IR transmission or ATR measurement using modern spectrometer lasts maybe a few minutes. A fast chemical reaction can be monitored with FDIR by applying 100 spectra per second. But to fully characterize a pulsed laser with pulse duration of a few microseconds and rise time in nanosecond scale, a faster method is required here. Only move the scanner faster is no more sufficient. Does FDIR come to its limit, or do we still have an ace in the sleeve? Indeed, and it is step scan. The, ska the step scan technique has been first commercially realized by Bruker decades ago. We may get an idea how the step scan technique works from its name. The moving mirror of the interferogram uh, of the interferometer moves not continuously, but rather step by step. Bruker spectrometers can reach the highest step scan stepping position accuracy of 1 nanometer and the highest temporal resolution of 4 nanoseconds. With the step scan technique, the high spectral resolution measurement is still possible because the spectral resolution depends on how far the scanner can move but not how it moves. One very important base to use the FTIR step scan technique is that your experiment is 100% repeatable. So um, let's have a closer look at the working principle of step scan. Um, here again, our interferogram with the mirror position as horizontal axis and intensity as vertical axis. 
Now、uh, we also have a third axis named by time. Here, in the normal scan mode, the scanner moves continuously, and then the signal on the detector gets collected at each sampling point continuously. In the step scan mode, the scanner moves to one sampling point and will stop there. Then. One can trigger the experiment to start, and then the signal on the detector gets recorded, recorded along the time axis within a user-defined time period. After the needed data points get collected, recorded along the time axis, the scanner can move to the next sampling point and stop there again. And then the same data recording can be done there again. And the next sampling point, and so on and so further. Here we can easily understand that the highest time resolution of such experiment would depend on how fast the detector can respond, and how fast the analog digital converter ADC is. And thanks to the trigger, you can always have the same starting moment of the experiment at each sampling point. At the end of step scan measurement, you get a matrix of data collected collected along the time axis at different sampling points. But we are going to analyze the data by rows, marked in red here, because each row represents the interferogram at a certain time point in the experiment. So, using this concept, we can do many interesting measurements, which are not possible with the conventional. Conventional approach. Another challenging scenario is to measure weak MIR signal, which is hidden in the room temperature thermal background, and for that we can use the so-called step scan amplitude modulation method. And here again we use the step scan technique, but we do not focus on the time resolution. In in the following, I will explain you the principle. Of this method, based on one example setup. Well, we use here a very weak laser diode as an external source, and we operate it in the modulated modulated mode, which means for the data acquisition, the constant room temperature thermal background and the modulated laser diode emission are both collected. By the detector at each sampling point along the time axis, and in the meanwhile, we also send the known modulation frequency of the diode to the lock-in amplifier, so that the lock-in amplifier will enhance the signal with the same modulation frequency and extract it out from the sum signal and send it back to ADC. In this way. The unwanted constant background can be eliminated using lock-in technique, and there is no need to subtract it later on. In addition, the lock-in amplifier also improves the sensitivity for such measurements, so that weak signal can be better detected. By using the step scan amplitude modulation, you will get a very nice result showing only the sample signal on a flat. Baseline. As we deal with thermal emission spectroscopy today, I want to step through some basics first. Here, thermal radiation origins in the fact that every object with temperature higher than zero Kelvin emits thermal radiation. The emitted radiation is highly temperature dependent, which is described by three very important laws: Stefan Boltzmann's law, Wien's displacement law, and Planck's law. Where the third law, Planck's law, is the most important, as it in includes the others, it delivers a description of the full shape of the spectral radiation density curve. Typical typical curves. Calculated from Planck's law can be seen here. Planck's law refers to the emission of a black body, which is an idolized body that absorbs all incoming radiation. This means 
it is the perfect idle emitter, and no object can emit more radiation. As the black black body is an idolized object, it can't be realized. But there are different ways in instrumental setups to come close or very close to a black body emission. The best one is a black body cavity source. Another one, but much less accurate, is the use of black plates、uh, with high absorptions in the investigated spectral regime. An emission experiment source is the sample. Brucker research spectrometers provide two input ports for emission experiment. The emitted light of the sample or source can be led into the spectrometer. To the interferometer, and、um, through these two emission ports, and at the end detected by the detector, or here. A very important term in emission experiment is emissivity, because with this term, the emission of real-world samples is usually described. Emissivity describes how effective a sample emits radiation in relation to the perfect and idolized black body at the same temperature. So,、um, a general definition is simple: is simply the、um, intensity of the sample emission divided by the theoretical black body emission. As the black body has maximum thermal radiation, emissivity of a sample will always be between zero and one. And further, by definition, the black body emissivity is one. By experience, the emission of a sample will depend on direction, temperature, and wave number. For homogeneous materials, we ignore the the angle dependences、um, and keep spectral dependence. Then it is possible to calculate the simplified value and do spectral integration. In FTIR emission spectroscopy, spectral dependent emissivity is determined.、Mm, one, one more very important field is the determination of emissivity.、Uh, Emissivity close or at room temperature. One could think we do it the same way as before, but due to physics, it will not be that simple. A detector can only see radiation from components that are hotter than they are themselves.、Um, so we can't measure room temperature or similar emissivity with a room temperature detector. We could apply a liquid nitrogen cooled detector, but because the sample has the same temperature as the surrounding, the detector signal will be dominated by signal from the surrounding, and the sample emission can't be extracted later. There's one solution, it's kind of workaround, which only works under certain circumstances. We can use standard reflectance measurement for the following reason: absorptance. Uh, reflectance and transmittance always equal one. If there is no transmission, which is the most important condition to apply this workaround, and if we apply that, the absorptance equals to emissivity in thermal equilibrium, then we can calculate the spectral emissivity by the formula one minus the spectral reflectance. So for not transparent. For non-transparent, opaque samples, the emissivity can be calculated from the reflectance. So let's summarize, and after that, I will jump right into the applications. Let me summarize why we use FDIR and what makes it so valuable in physics applications. From the aspect of users, a physicist. And they care about the width and the depth of the achievable information. It is not only for identification and quantification. It is also about kinetics. How does the spectrum change influenced by temperature, by magnetic field, or change over time? What can be additionally discovered in slow motion? How to combine hypernated technique like a microscope with 
IR spectrometer and how to include more dim dimensions or traces into the experimental results. That is why we used to, that is why we tried to achieve by applying FTIR in physics. Furthermore, FTIR is an established and proven method. method. It is very easy to customize, adapt to the special needs of the user. Its high precision and sensitivity are further reasons why FDIR has been well accepted and considered as a powerful and indispensable tool for physics studies. Okay, um, that was a lot of information. In the next part, it will be a, a little less theoretical and we'll, I will show you a few application examples. Mm, the very first example comes from laser physics. Um, here we measure the emission of a mid IR laser diode in a nanosecond scale. This is an experiment we often do in our demo lab in Ettling in Germany to demonstrate the functionality and performance of step scan technique. As you can see here, besides resolving the several emission lines, at different wave numbers, we can also see the intensity change of the emission along the time. Here you see uh, we are able to achieve high temporal and high spectral resolution at the same time using step scan technique. Indeed, similar or even identical setups are used in the research labs to record the emission profile of pulse laser over time or to characterize to characterize newly developed emitting devices with a temporal behavior. Uh, over the past 20 years, quantum cascade laser, QCL in short, this technique has matured into the laser of choice for long wavelength operation. QCLs have become an invaluable tool for many applications such as absorption spectroscopy, chemical imaging, and trace gas detection or infrared countermeasure systems. A lot of research efforts um, are still done to further reduce the cost, higher the stability, and to adapt them to specific uses. Um, here in this example, one of our Vertex ATV users from Australia uses the step scan setup to measure the QCL laser emission in the mid infrared range. With a very high spectral resolution of 0.075 wave number and nanosecond time resolution, the sweep of the QCL emission can be nicely chased. And from the result shown here, the researcher can conclude that at 18 and 19 degrees C, the QCL emission has swept 1.2 or 1.1 wave number within 2 milliseconds, respectively. This is a very nice example for QCL emission experiment using time-resolved step scan method. One typical time-resolved step scan ex experiment is the so-called optical pump probe spectroscopy. A pump probe experiment utilizes two light beams, a pump beam and a probe beam, that interact with a sample material. The pump beam initiates a sample response. A probe beam monitors the response, usually with a lower optical intensity that does not significantly affect the sample. In the well-known pump probe experiments, both the pump and the probe beams come from a single beam of laser pulses um, that is then split into two parts. This type of pump probe experiment is well suited for measuring um, the lifetime of electronic excitations with femtosecond time resolution. Here in our experiment, out of the biophysics, nanosecond temporal resolution is already sufficient. The sample will be excited by a um, pulsed laser in order to measure the change of the IR absorption due to the photo excitation um, in a FTIR spectrometer equipped uh, with step scan. Um, the visible laser is the pump beam and the IR source, uh, the probe beam. On the left-hand side, you see the published result 
measured by our Vertex user at the University of Freiburg, showing the IR absorbance change of bacterial rhodopsin due to pulsed visible excitation. On the right-hand side, a low-temperature photo excitation setup with Vertex ATV and Oxford cryostat at the Australian National University is shown. Optoelectronics or optronics is the study and application of electronic devices and systems that source, detect and control light, usually considered as a subfield of photonics. One type of optoelectronic devices is electrical to, op to optical transducer. As we looked at so far, um, all are whole source or at least macroscopic sample. A brand new and still developing topic is the thermal emission spectroscopy and microscopic scale. In this example from optoelectronics, we measure a microemitter or optoelectronic device using Brugger Research Spectrometer combined with a IR microscope Hyperion. For this purpose, Brugger can equip the Hyperion microscope uh, when attached uh, to a research spectrometer with an emission option. That emission option extends the possibilities of the microscope. Standard for every Hyperion is the transmission and reflectance mode, and optionally by the modification of the objective ATR measurements possible. Um, those techniques ha have in common that um, radiation from the spectrometer's uh, internal source is sent to the Hyperion, runs through the sample on Hyperion stage, and finally hits a detector that sits in the Hyperion. We can say that all these techniques belong to the normal mode of, oper of uh, Hyperion operation, and spectrometer as radiation always um, goes from spectrometer to microscope. Uh, within the new emission option, a new mode is enabled where uh, the radiation from the stage of the microscope is collected and sent to the main spectrometer through its interferometer. Finally, it is uh, detected, is directed to a detector in the main spectrometer. The lateral resolution is determined uh, by the aperture size in the Hyperion and the mapping of a sample is possible. Um, where an imaging option is of course not possible, um, it does not exist for the new emission option. A homemade setup can be used where a miniature device is driven by a voltage and emits radiation due to thermal heating. Lincoln stage or similar temper uh, tempered sample cells can also be used here. Uh, such a setup can be built on Hyperion stage um, and the emitting area can be then brought into focus. The investigation of such miniature components can be very crucial for the developing of new devices in a smaller scale. In the shown experiment, the emitting area was 0.65 mm times 0.65 mm. We drove the device with 5 volts, and according to manufacturer, this leads to a temperature up to 500 degrees C. With a lateral resolution of 250 micrometer, we were able to map the emitter strength over the emitting area. The emitter strengths were determined by integrating the emission spectrum at each measurement point. And nicely, it can be seen that the strength is strong, strongest in center, and we were able to map the decrease nicely. Um, another example from optoelectronics is the vertical cavity surface emitting lasers, uh, VIXO for short. There are a special type of semiconductor laser diodes, which in contrast to conventional edge emitting laser diodes, emit perpendicular to the chip surface and tools can be easily packaged as emitter arrays containing hundreds of emitters on a single chip. VIXOs are used for face and gesture recognition telecommunication, proximity sensors, augmented reality displays, lidars for robotics like the floor cleaning robots, you know, and um, autonomous vehicles. Therefore, characterization of VIXO emission spectrum 
power, beam profile, noise, etc., et is critical for development and improvement of these devices. Since um, VIXOs have very sharp emission lines, um, high spectral resolution will be required to fully resolve the emission profiles. Furthermore, for most applications, the stability of emitting intensity over time is also important. Therefore, high temporal resolution is also a must for FTIR spectrometer to map the emission behavior over time in order to find out room for improvement for VIXOs. As we explained before, a step scan technique can fulfill both above technical requirements perfectly, and a vacuum FDIR spectrometer provides the best step scan performance. At Darmstadt, at Darmstadt University of Technology in Germany, researchers have used the FTIR step scan setup uh, to characterize VIXO laser. A pulsed generator has been applied to trigger the data acquisition at each interferogram point. The resulting um, spectral temporally res uh, resolved uh, intensity distribution for an applied one microsecond long current pulse is presented here at the bottom right. Uh, I want to point out here, VIXOs can be, uh, cannot be uh, only be used uh, as source or emitters, but also as detectors or receivers. In some applications, even applied as both at the same time, like a face scanning device for a security system. Brooker provides major solutions for source and detector characterization perfectly supporting this research field. Well, the next example is about metamaterial, which has been a very hot research topic under photonics since decades and is still attracting much interest and investigations. Metamaterials are uh, artificial materials engineered to have properties that may not be found in nature. Um, they are assemblies of multiple individual elements uh, fashioned uh, from conventional microscopic materials such as metals or plastics, but usually arranged in pre-designed periodic patterns. Many scientists in different fields have donated a lot of effort to tailor the novel properties of metamaterials, in particular, the optical ones. For example, the development of photonic crystals has given us an unprecedented uh, uh, flexibility in designing both linear and nonlinear optical properties in terms of refractive index and the electric permittivity as a function of wavelength and for different uh, directions um, and polar polarizations. Well, in easy words, metamaterials can be designed with a special optical response. For example, it blocks light of certain wavelengths, direction or polarization, whereas other wavelengths propagate almost without loss and even around the corner. Mm. By changing the pattern, by changing the pattern form or dimensions, um, its response to light uh, with wavelengths bigger than the pattern can be tuned. The motivation of, develop, of developing such magical materials is huge, since um, they find applications in photonic, plasmonic, microantenna terahertz devices, electrical tuning, telecommunication, computer technology, aerospace, military defense, and laser techniques, and so on. Um, in the result achieved by the research group of Professor Giesen and Liu at the University of Stuttgart, high transparency in the physical, uh, in the visible spectral range has been realized for the samples. And this sets the base for the development of invisib invisible materials or coating. The researchers managed to predict the response of the designed material with theoretical models and know in advance the influence of different surface structures here. They know in advance um, the, dif the different 
the influence of different surface structures on the transmittance values. This means the optical properties of the artificial materials are tunable and designable. Well, here's another metal material example for the mid-infrared region. Mid-infrared emitters are also called thermal emitters, and typical thermal emitters shows Planck's emission profile, as explained at the beginning, um, with broad emission band. And this metal material designed by US researchers is a rare selective thermal emitter since it features sharp emission lines with tunable position. Depending on the size and uh, arrangement of the pattern on the surface, the achieved metal material emits at different wavelengths or exhibits two or mo even more sharp bands. By tuning the temperature, the band's intensity grows, as you see here, um, without a broadening of the bands. The next example is also an experiment on a thermal emitter, an emitter which can be found in our daily life. Um, it is an infrared uh, physiotherapy lamp. Here, users in the Tianjin Medical Device Test Center could determine the emissivity of the product here by using a black body as reference. Both sample and reference a whole sources and could be placed in front of the emission ports of a research spectrometer directly for measurement. Further, the so-called two-temperature emission correlation was used to compensate all spectrometer characteristics. In that method, the reference um, black body cavity source is measured at two different temperatures to determine a correlation function, and that correlation function is used with the measured physiotherapy lamp emission spectrum at at a similar temperature to determine the emission spectrum of the lamp. Comparison with the black body spectrum delivers uh, the emissivity of the sample source. Then. Well, um, Brooker supported this customer evaluation with a customer-inspired macro, which is now also available for our, all other users. Well, solar thermal energy is a form of energy and a technology for harnessing solar energy, energy and to generate thermal energy. Solar thermal collectors are a special kind of heat exchangers that convert solar radiation into thermal energy. And solar thermal materials are used in building industry for window materials, um, for um, or for heating installations in solar thermal power plant and or for uh, functional textiles. Um, for solar thermal applications, um, it is essential that the optical properties um, of the solar absorber surface meet the requirements and FTR spectroscopy is the ideal tool to analyze these properties. As I mentioned at the beginning, determination of emissivity close or at room temperature requires a workaround. For non-transparent opaque samples, the emissivity can be calculated from the reflectance. And in the example data, we measured two solar materials for comparison and calculated their emissivity. A good solar thermal collector a good one absorbs well and emits less, like the sample 2. Development of other new functional materials, such as new polymers ap applied for aerospace, also needs FTIR, since besides temporary resistance, reflectance and, and transmission measurement in mid-infrared region also must be done. Uh, one of the analysis methods frequently used um, in semiconductor R&D is photoluminescence, PL in short. It can clarify electronic structure and more, uh, like band gap and related transitions. As we know, in atoms or molecules, we often have discrete uh, energy levels. When atoms are packed, to a periodic crystal lattice, then we have so-called energy bands, conductive 
and uh, valence bands regarding electronic structure. In semiconductors, the band gap between the conductive and the valence bands uh, lies in the IR or visible region. In PL experiment, the following is done. We excite an electron from the valence band to the conduction band. And then after internal relaxation, the electron falls back to the valence band and gives the characteristic emission of PL. The spectral position of the PL signal can directly give us information about the band gap, um, the band gap width of the material. Um, Brooker offers various solutions for PL experiment in visible and mid infrared regions at room temperature and low temperature in transmission and reflection modes. PL experimental setup is a very complicated topic. More detailed explanation and hints are summarized uh, in another webinar um, with the topic Emission Spectroscopy Part 2 PL. And you may find a recording of that webinar on our webpage. For mid infrared, the weak PL signal is often covered by the room temperature thermal background since we use a low temper de temperature detector. So I explained this um, problem at the beginning in the theory part in the theory part. So, to cancel out the background, we trigger the PL signal by triggering the excitation laser and make use of the locking technique to get nice PL peak out of the background. And this is, as I explained at the beginning, the step scan amplitude modulation technique. In the shown publication, temperature dependent investigation of a semiconductor material with different composition have been done. Well, a different composition. Um, and demonstrating how layer composition and temperature can influence band structure and optical properties of semiconductor materials. Well, in the field of solid state physics, superconductivity as a macroscopic quantum state of matter has attracted scientists for more than 100 years since the discovery in Mercury in 1911. Um, Superconductors exhibit fascinating electronic and magnetic properties like zero resistance and perfect diamagnetic magnetism, which have um, irreplaceable applications in many fields such as electric power transmission, high magnetic field generation, ultra weak magnetic field detection, as well as quantum computing who are seeking for high critical temperature superconductors and understanding the mechanism of unconventional superconductivity are two of the most important topics in this research. And optical spectroscopy is a very powerful technique to study the charge and lattice dynamics in unconventional superconductors. Scientists from the Center of Superconductivity Physics and materials in Nanjing University have long been using infrared spectroscopy to study physics of unconventional superconductivity. And the absolute re reflectivity of superconducting materials can be measured with ultra high precision in a very broad spectral range from 8 to 50,000 wave number. Well, this is around 1 milli electron volt to 6.5 to 5 mil, uh, electron volt. A different temperature from room temperature down to liquid helium temperature um, using a vertex um, ATV spectrometer. Well, in the example measurement data here achieved at the University of Stuttgart shown on the right side, the reflectivity of the sample has been measured at different temperature and a temperature lower than the critical temperature, a clear increase of the reflectivity can be recorded. And this minimal reflectivity variation of less than 2% showed the transition to superconduction. And here the superconductivity gap can be then determined to be smaller than 100 wave number. Well, till now we have mainly shown application examples from the research. 
Here is an example in the silicon industry. One of the main technologies for renewable energy is solar energy, besides hydropower, wind power, bioenergy, and geothermal energy. The development of affordable, inexhaustible, and clean solar energy technologies has huge long-term benefits globally. In the competitive photovoltaic industries, quality control of silicon is critical to save costs and maximize maximize efficiency. Since um, elemental impurities and disruptions of the crystal lattice have profound impact on the optical and electrical properties of silicon. FTIR analysis of carbon and oxygen in silicon is fast, sensitive, destruction-free, and therefore a widely accepted method of silicon quality control. The example data at the bottom right show the, a, show the reference, sample, and difference spectrum of a room temperature carbon and oxygen quantification measurement. According to ASTM semi-standards, the pure silicon contribution is eliminated via an algorithm and the concentration of C and O can be calculated from band height via conversion factors. The, detec the detection limit for room temperature analysis for an idle sample range to 200 ppba for a sample thickness of around 1.5 mm. So as we know, shallow impurities can significantly affect the electrical property. Determination of shallow impurities B or P, bore and phosphor, and low temperature near infrared photoluminescence for, quali uh, for quantification of shallow impurities with unmatched sensitivity are further possibilities of FTIR silicon QC. Upright is the result measured using a cryosas. The all in one silicon, silicon analyzer for industrial environment from Bruca showing the bore and phosphor content in the sample. Just as a rule of thumb, the specified detection limits of cryosas for phosphor reaches 10 ppta and for bore 30 ppta. These values are specified for a sample with thickness 3 mm. Furthermore, solar cells um, have a complex structure with multiple layers of different materials, sometimes as thin as few nanometers. Passivation layers on semiconductors play a very important role and serve as, for example, pr uh, protection, electric isolation, or anti-reflectance layer. FTIR spectrometers allow determination of the layer thickness of semiconductor layer structures with highest accuracy. This ap application is based on the evaluation of interference created by the investigation layers and can be applied to layers with a thickness between less than one micron and up to several millimeter. Also, doping concentration of the intentionally doped semiconductors and semiconductor layers can be determined via FDIR by IR interaction of free carriers. In case of higher doping concentrations, this is often done via reflectance spectra, applying a mm, dedicated evaluation software based on Mike Maxwell equations. Well, mapping measurements can also be done for wafers with FTIR spectrometers equipped with dedicated wafer map mapping accessories. Uh, reflectance and transmittance spectra can be automatically recorded at different sample positions combined with the layer thickness evaluation, quantitative analysis of layers, and many more. Uh, for more detailed information about silicon QC use FTI using FTIR, for example, about a detection limit and how to choose the right instrumental setup for the intended result, and when is low temperature silicon QC required in case of uh, interest, please visit our webpage or review the past webinars with the topic high sensitivity silicon QC using FTIR. Last but not least, in this uh, example, I want to show you how the world's highest resolving FTIR spectrometer, Bruca's IFS 125HR, contributes to monitoring atmospheric pollution. In the regard of uh, climate change, atmospheric research has never been more active and important than now.
To better understand the global atmospheric change, in particular the exchange of greenhouse gases, um, in, which means CO2, CH4, N2O, CO, H2O, and HDO, between the atmosphere and biosphere has to be monitored. In the right picture, you see the Bruker IFS 125HR ultra high resolving spectrometer with this impressive interferometer design, ensuring a beam integrity over the extreme long optical path difference up to 11 meters. With this accurate instrument shape, outstanding wave wavelength precision, and the atmosphere spectral resolution, of course, IFS uh, 125 is the FDIR spectrometer of the choice for global research organizations such as the Total Carbon Column Op Observation Network, TCON, or the Network for the Detection of Atmospheric uh, Composition Change, NDACC. Networks of ground-based IFS 125HR record atmospheric spectra using the sun as light source in the near-infrared and mid- or mid-infrared spectral regions. The received high-precision data can be used uh, to, for example, complement the satellite measurements from NASA. And while the IFS 125HR is installed in observation center, a mountain peak of the famous Jungfrau Joch in Switzerland. So that's it basically. Today we highlighted the universality, versatility and accuracy of infrared spectroscopy and scratched the surface of, of what's possible. What you should take with you is that FTIR is not only a tool for chemistry but is also widely applicable in physics studies for time-resolved spectroscopy. It is indispensable for development and characterization of new optical materials or devices. It contributes a lot, not only in basic research field, but also in semiconductor industry quality control. So all that's left to say is thank you for your attention and we will now switch back to Simon for the question session. Thank you.